This term, we're looking at the heart of God for his wayward people through the lens of the Old Testament book, 2 Samuel. And 1 and 2 Samuel are the story of the king of Israel in 1000 BC. David, the king, was a truly great man, one of the greatest men who have ever lived. Um, I'm told that this story in 1 and 2 Samuel of, of, of David is the longest and greatest single narrative presentation in all ancient literature of a single individual human life. Not just in the Bible, but in all ancient literature. David is that significant. He's the king God chose for Israel, and throughout his life, he shows himself to be a man of great courage and patience and wisdom and faithfulness and devotion and compassion. He's the one who faces off against a nine-foot Goliath with just a sling and a couple of stones. He's the one who flees for his life from a crazed King Saul sleeps in caves and yet trusts God every day. He's the writer of some of the most elegant and spiritual psalms we have in the Bible. And he's the one who invites the nephew Mephibosheth of his defeated enemy to come and live in his palace. And he showers him with mercy after mercy. The reason David is the most written about character in all of ancient history is that he is one of the greatest men who ever lived. He is greater than you or I will ever be. He is truly a remarkable man. And in 2 Samuel 11, David is at the height of his greatness. And then this happens. This is one of the most famous sins in all of history. David has an affair with another man's wife and he covers it up by killing that man and taking that woman as his own wife. The story's been depicted in music and arts for centuries. Leonard Cohen's song, Hallelujah, so masterfully covered by Jeff Buckley, is about this affair. Rembrandt paints Bathsheba with all her sensuous curves, her hips exposed, and in her hand is a letter from King David making his intentions clear. There's worry and concern on her face. The look of someone who knows what they're required to do. Sadly, most people characterize Bathsheba as a sex kitten, bewitching a godly king, like the sculpture by the American artist Ben Victor. But as we'll see, it couldn't be further from the truth. So let's pick it up. 2 Samuel chapter 11. If you've got your Bibles, open up this remarkable story. This is how it begins. In the spring, at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. So here we see a great man in the wrong place at the wrong time. His men, they're in the battlefield fighting for him and his cause. Why wasn't he with them? While they spent themselves and risked their lives, he was killing his time on a rooftop like Hugh Hefner in his dressing gown. And as he stands in the cool of the evening on his balcony, from his vantage point up there, he looks down and he sees a woman bathing who was very beautiful. There's no suggestion that the woman was acting provocatively. And it was not wrong for David to notice her beauty. But we know what David should have done. The spark of lust ignites and the moment to flee is when it first flares up, not when it's burning down your house. But his glance turns to a gaze and he doesn't stamp out the spark, he fans it into a flame and sends out someone to find out who this woman is. Verse 3, she's Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. 
So it wasn't out of ignorance that he will do what he does. He knew that this was another man's wife. In fact, a great man's wife. This is one of his highest officials in his army who's off fighting for him right now. And it's the granddaughter of one of his most trusted advisors. But David ignores all of that. Controlled by his lust, he sends some messengers, verse 4, to get her. We're told earlier what her name is, but David never uses her name. He doesn't think of her as a person, but as a commodity to use for his own pleasure. And so he sends messengers to get her. And verse 4, she came to him. She has little choice in the matter. The most powerful man in the world says, come and have sex. Hard to disagree with. And verse 4, he slept with her and she left. Simple, really. No strings attached. This could be what you might call a one-night stand. The world tells us that adultery happens. The media implies that it's normal, that it is innocent. But it is never innocent. It is never normal. It's never no small thing. It always hurts you and hurts those around you. And then, some weeks later, David receives a note, perhaps through a messenger, that says, I'm pregnant. And now he realises the situation is not as clear as he thought it would be. The consequences of the flames of lust are catching a light and starting to get out of control. So he brings the husband, Uriah, back from the battle lines in the hope that he will sleep with his wife and that it can be said that the child born is his child. But Uriah is too honourable a man to do that. Verse 11, he says to David when he gets back from the battlefield, he says, the ark and Israel and Judah, they're staying in tents. And my commander Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and make love with my wife. As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. He will not take the privilege of sleeping with his wife while his mates are out sleeping in tents by the battlefield. What a contrast to his king who takes the advantage of his men by sleeping with their wives while they're out in the battlefield. Well, David, noting this, sends Uriah back to the front line carrying a letter signing a death warrant on his own life. And the letter reads this, verse 15, put Uriah out in front where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so he will be struck down and die. Now, just imagine this. Uriah has that note in his hand. David sends the note with Uriah, with the note, signing his death warrant in his hand. And David knows that this man is so faithful that he won't open it up and read it. He, David trusts him that much. And yet David is plotting to kill such a man, such is how wonderful Uriah is. He really is the hero of this story. And so Joab, the commander of the army, executes the plan. And a report comes back to David from the front line saying that a couple of your men died in battle and Uriah was one of those men, verse 24. And David replies mercilessly to the messenger, verse 25, saying, say this to Joab, don't let this upset you. And David is at the same time speaking to himself and placating his own conscience. But, verse 26, when Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. And the time of mourning, when the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to his house and she became his wife and bore him a son. Did she know what he had done? Well, we're not told, but there is... There she is, newly married to her husband's killer. And David thinks it's all cleared up now. The fire's put out, the loose ends are tied up, the palace staff, they know about the injustice that has been committed, and yet it goes unpunished. 
and it looks as though he's gotten away with it in the end. But verse 27, we're told this thing David had done displeased the Lord. He forgot that God is the one to whom all hearts are open, all secrets are known, and all desires are seen. And as the Bible says, you may be sure that your sin will find you out, and David's does. Even if no one else finds out, God is watching. He may be silent, but he is not sightless. What sins are you committing right now that you've hidden from everyone else? But God sees. The thing David had done displeased the Lord. You know, I know we love to sing songs about God's love, God's grace, his mercy, his kindness. But the anger of God is also a wonderful thing. It's a great thing. God is displeased. And this brings great comfort to victims of injustice. If your son had been murdered by the man who raped or at the very least slept with your daughter-in-law, you would be glad that God is displeased. God's anger is unfashionable in a country where injustice is rare. But God's anger is very precious to those who are victims of injustice. This thing displeased the Lord. Praise God. God for that. Now, what will God do? Well, in the next chapter, this is what we read. 2 Samuel 12, the Lord sent Nathan to David. Now, Nathan has a very risky task. He is a prophet and he has to talk to the king and expose the king's sin. But he knows that the king has the power to do to him whatever he pleases. And so he starts with a story. It's a wonderful story. This is how it goes. There were two men in a certain town, one rich, the other poor. The rich man had a very large number of sheep and cattle, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb that he had bought. He raised it and it grew up with him and his children. It shared his food, drank from his cup and even slept in his arms. It was like a daughter to him. Now a traveller came to the rich man, but the rich man refrained from taking one of his own sheep or cattle to prepare a meal for the traveller who had come to him. Instead, he took the one little ewe lamb that belonged to the poor man and prepared it for the one who had come to him. Nathan tells his story to David, and David is Furious, He says, verse 5 of chapter 12, the man who did this must die. And Nathan, Nathan the prophet says to David with piercing directness, you are that man. Many women that you have, but you take the one woman that belongs to that one man. And some of us have done this. Some of you are doing this right now, and you must stop. It displeases the Lord. I beg you to repent and find forgiveness today. You know, the cost of adultery is always enormous. A number of years ago, there was a man in leadership at our church who had an affair with the husband of a lady in our church. And for him, it was just about love. Who could blame him? But it was Liz and I and a few other wonderful people in our church who had to sit with this wife and help her deal with the betrayal and hurt. The unseen cost was enormous. It is evil. It displeases the Lord. And if you're in that place today, repent. For God is angry. And so look at David's response. Verse 13, he's cut to the heart. And rightly so. And he says, I have sinned against the Lord. He writes a, a song about this, Psalm 51, go and trace it up on your own. But he names it, he owns it, I have sinned against the Lord. And the Lord replies through the prophet Nathan, the Lord has taken away your sin.'" 
forgiveness received for a heinous sin. And so here is good news, the good news of God's grace for sinful people like you and I. It is an epic story. No wonder it's fired the imagination of artists and songwriters throughout history. And as we stop and reflect on this story, I think it reminds us of two things. It reminds us of our need for a king who will save us and not destroy us. So let's look at those two things briefly as we wrap up. We need a king who won't, first of all, destroy us, and then second of all, who, won't, who will save us. First of all, we need a king who won't destroy us. King David is the greatest man who ever lived in Israel. Not only was he fearless in battle, he was compassionate in life. If ever there could be a king who could lead God's people, he was it. There's never been and never will be a greater king in our world. And yet, he takes another man's wife, impregnates her, and to cover up, he has the one of his most loyal soldiers killed. The consequence of this action is that he will lose the child born to Bathsheba, he will lose control of his family, and he will ultimately lose control of his kingdom. His lust burns down his life, and it destroys the lives of his people. Now, every leader... Every human leader is flawed, even the best, the very best. And we suffer the consequence of their failures acutely. And perhaps you're very aware of that living in Australia right now in lockdown. You know, last week, Andy reminded us of the misplaced hope that we place in our leaders, in our government, in our political system, in our economic programs, in our foreign policy and in our education system. We look to those things to solve the deep problems in our world and our communities, but every disappointment that inevitably follows does not seem to have the power to teach us that the resources of humanity are simply inadequate to solve the dilemmas of humanity. We keep putting hope in our leaders, and we keep being disappointed. And that's what this story is about. Here's the greatest king in history, and even he is not able to bring what we dream of. In spite of all that God had given David and did for him, he was a flawed human being like you and I. What we need is a king who is not flawed, and that is the king that David points to. For David was the anointed one. But he never measured up. He couldn't. The way he destroys Bathsheba and Uriah proves it. We need a king, a king from God in heaven. And that is how Jesus' life begins. Do you remember when the angels announce the birth of Jesus to the shepherds? They say, today... In the town of David, a saviour has been born to you. He is the anointed one, the Lord. Now, here is David's great, great descendant. Today in the town of David, a saviour, not a destroyer, a saviour is born. And as we watch this child grow up in the Gospels, we realise that he would never mistreat women. He will never use them. He will never see the lives of his friend as expendable. He would never make them pay for his sins. He would never try and cover up the truth. Rather, he gives his life to pay for their sins. That's the kind of king we need. It's the kind of king you need. Every woman in the world needs a king who won't bring them into his bed to use them. And in every man in the world needs a king who won't treat their lives as expendable. Jesus Christ, he didn't bring any women into his bedroom and he doesn't murder any of his men. He offers his life up for them. We need a king that won't destroy us. And then secondly and finally, we need a king who will save us. Because we're not just like Bathsheba in the story, victims of the sins and cruelty of others. We are in varying degrees, like David. 
we know how strong temptation is. And you and I, we have given in to it. And we've sought to cover up our sins by lies and deception. Perhaps you and I, we've never murdered anybody, but this story does hold up a mirror to our souls. And we do see ourselves in it. And Jesus, when he enters into our world, the, the angels announce that a saviour has been born. And Jesus has come to save us from our sins. And notice that David, he doesn't save himself from the guilt and the shame. God saves him by sending the prophet Nathan to confront him, that he might repent and find forgiveness. Now, we learn a lot about how God saves a person from this story. Notice what David's busy doing. He's busy trying to cover up. He spins a web of lies and rationalizations around him. And we do this. Powerful people especially do this. Powerful people in positions of leadership, they tell themselves that because they've suffered a great deal or sacrificed a great deal, that because they're recovering from enormous amounts of opposition and criticism, so much of which is unfair and wrong, but because they feel that they are suffering and sacrificing so much, deep inside, the seed of self-pity grows, which makes them take what is not theirs. We saw this in the tragic story of Ravi Zacharias, one of the great, who was one of the great Christian heroes of the last 50 years. And, um, and after his death, terrible stories came out. And the st- And the justifications and rationalizations he made for them were exactly this. I've sacrificed much. I deserve this. And he covers it up and he justifies it and collateral damage is done. But we all do this in varying degrees. And what happens is we spin such a web of lies and deceit that it makes it impossible for us to see what's wrong with ourselves. And so... That's where David's at. And God sends Nathan in to save David. And he he does a loving thing in sending Nathan to confront David with his sin. You see, you never know you're sinning when you're sinning, usually. I like what Tim Keller says on this passage. He says, when David slept with Bathsheba, he didn't feel like a sinner, but a lover. And when he gave the order for Uriah to be killed, he didn't feel like a murderer, but a general. Generals are always giving orders that they know will result in the deaths of others. So David, he has deceived himself. And so do we. The habits of our heart that are killing us are the ones that we don't see. That's why they control us. And that's why we don't see them, because we don't want to see them. We don't want to know them. And therefore, we need a saviour who has the courage to confront us. Now, Nathan confronts David, and notice how he does it. It's amazing. Tells him a story about sheep. Now, why doesn't Nathan just cut to the chase? You know, what's with this story? Well, David's conscience needs time to wake up. And Nathan wakes up his conscience by telling him a story about a rich man with many sheep who steals the poor man's one little ewe lamb. Nathan, he starts very carefully, very quietly. He says, hey, let me just tell you about this case. And when David says that the man should die, Nathan knows that his conscience has been brought to the surface. Now, notice something very important here. When he says, you are the man, that wasn't the introduction. It's the conclusion. Now, what does that mean? It means a lot of things. It means, you know, David was a leader and, and, and prophet of God, and yet he had lied, he'd committed adultery and even murder. Why didn't Nathan immediately burst into Dathan's palace and say, I know what you've done. Why did you do that? Well, it's not because Nathan lacks courage. It's because as a prophet of God, he's reflecting the grace of God. If there's any ever hope of saving David or us, 
God has to convict us of sin. Not just condemn us. God never confronts us in such a way that we feel condemned without any hope of deliverance. It's very easy to condemn someone in such a way that you raise their defense mechanisms up so high in such a way that they will never repent. You've done that. You've seen that happen in someone else's life. It glorifies God to tell the truth about sin, but it glorifies God even more if the person you're telling the truth about their sin repents. And if you condemn a person in such a way that it makes them impossible, makes it impossible for them to repent, you're not on God's side. You're not a vehicle of the grace of God. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save it. And that's what Christianity is about. God comes into the world and he confronts the world with our sin but not to condemn us, but to convict us that we might repent and be forgiven. He says, hey, you guys, you've got, I've got a problem. I love you. I want you to realize that you've sinned. It's destroying you. But forgiveness is on offer. I'm going to give my life for you that you can be clean and washed. Come back. Turn back. Repent. See, there's no salvation without repentance. David says to Nathan, I've sinned against the Lord. There's no excuses, no cloaking, no loophole, no blame shifting, no minimizing. He acknowledges his guilt openly. And Nathan replies, the Lord has taken away your sin. You're not going to die. Now, we love to hear the Lord has taken away your sin. But how many of us regularly say what David says, I have sinned against the Lord, honestly, openly, directly, without blame shifting. He can't have one without the other. Too much of Christianity today is all about forgiveness and grace and mercy without repentance and conviction and taking sin seriously. You can't have one without the other. And that's why Jesus can't, came. He comes to us. He says, I will die to take away your sin. But we must say to him, I have sinned against the Lord. In Christ, God comes not to condemn us, but to save us. And he does that by dying for us. He says, you are the man. You are the woman. You are the sinner. He exposes our sin, but he dies to cover what has been exposed and bear the penalty for the sin that we've committed. How can God assure us of pardon no matter how bad our sins are? Well, at the end of the story, God forgives the guilt of David's sin, but he inflicts him with the consequences of his sin. His son dies. But in Jesus, God forgives us of our sin and he bears the consequences of our sin as well. There's a great hymn by John Newton, which I'd love to read in conclusion. This is how it goes. In evil long I took delight, unawed by shame or fear, till a new object struck my sight and stopped my wild career. I saw one hanging on a tree in agony and blood, who fixed his languid eyes on me as near his cross I stood. Sure, never to my latest breath can I forget that look. It seemed to charge me with his death, though not a word he spoke. My conscience felt and owned the guilt and plunged me in despair. I saw my sins his blood had spilt and helped to nail him there. A second look he gave which said, I freely all forgive. This blood is for thy ransom paid. I die that thou may live. Thus, while his death my sin displays in all its blackest hue, such is the mystery of grace. It seals my pardon too.